So welcome everybody to our next episode of the Exploring Social Transformation podcast and I am extremely excited today to be welcoming the inimitable Hannah Close. So thank you so much for joining us Hannah. Um, so as well as being my dear friends and an all-around wonderful human being, Hannah's a curator, writer and photographer. She's currently pursuing an MA in Engaged Ecology at Schumacher College and alongside this works with the Transformative Educational Platform at VIA having recently designed a course on the topic of kinship, which I'm really excited to chat to her about in a minute. So in 2018, she founded the Experimental Thought Co, the pioneering community that hosted events on culture change and curated the nature, human slash nature series, bringing together the worlds of myth, ecology and psychology. She's also a consultant for the think tank Perspectiva with a particular interest in metaphor. So Hannah, welcome so much to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Theo. So kicking off, you've been pretty busy over the last six months and even a year. So what have you been up to? So where to begin? Um, <clears throat> I have just been wrapping up the talk part of my MA in Engaged Ecology at Schumacher College. And that's been a two year journey because um, I've been doing it part time. So that wrapped up a few weeks ago wrapped up the first iteration of the kinship course with Advaya uh, a couple of months back. And what else has been happening? Well, in the last couple of months, I've kind of just been taking stock of those two giant chapters of my life and then modeled myself for the next one. Um, but yeah, I'm in that kind of cocoon, cocoon chrysalis phase at the moment or the next thing comes up. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly enough to be getting along with, isn't it? And yeah. you know, Sch Schumacher is something that I I'd love to, to explore in a bit more depth down the line. But just starting off, would you like to, to tell us a little around the, about the kinship course? So, you know, yeah. what it was, what your, your process was and for, for designing it and so on. So it's called a course, I suppose that's what people have been calling it. And it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. So I... Halfway through the design process, I decided that I wanted to call it a collective inquiry because while we had, you know, people who were teachers coming in to share various parts of their expertise, it was also a um, endeavor to kind of ask questions and open doors rather than give answers. Uh, so it definitely took on the, the, the feeling of an inquiry. Um, and I also really wanted it to be more of a like connected collaborative journey, um, including the participants. So we kind of had the core taught sessions once a week. I think we did it over two months. And then we would have these collective inquiry sessions where we would come together as a group and we would do like various embodiment activities. And we would sit with questions from the previous week's uh, lecture or, or workshop. Um, and the design of the course in its first iteration was made so that um, we kind of took like a meta or like broad bird's eye view over various different topics around the theme of kinship, which is in some ways another way of saying relationship um, with a bit more like context to it. Um, so we, yeah, we had eight weeks and we, we started off looking at um, why even bother looking at this? Like, why are we doing a course slash collective inquiry on this topic? Why is it relevant now? And then we kind of moved into themes like the community and the individual, the more than human. We looked at why stories are relevant. Um, we looked at the politics of relationship, which is like a really, really core cool theme. Um, and all of these kinds of things. And while we sort of skimmed around quite a lot on the surface level, at least next year's iteration of the course will start to like dig deeper. Um, but it was really interesting and really generative. And we had almost 450 people in the cohort. Amazing. The first go was like, ah, <laughs> loads of people here. Um, but the appetite was there for it. Um, and there's a real longing to understand how to relate better between ourselves. Well, yeah, and it, it seems that like one of those topics that particularly just coming out of, of the pandemic where, you know, so many of us have been so isolated for so long, kind of, it seems like such a, a pertinent area to be exploring. And I, so I can really see that appetite. I mean, it's fascinating that you, you touched on kind of deciding almost halfway through the design to, to pivot from a more traditional course to this idea of a collective inquiry. 
talk me through a little bit around what kind of caused that that pivot and then how that ended up sort of cashing out and the, the results that you think we saw of that in the course as opposed to taking a more traditional route? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, because it was done online via Zoom, you're like, before you get out of the gate, you're limited by what you can actually do. And this is something that I'm going to soon be figuring out for the next year's iteration of the course, like a hybrid model between doing stuff online so that you can have, you know, people from, I think Advaya courses have had people from over 52 different countries on one course at any given time, which is like amazing. Mm. You can have that and then um, supplement that with the in-person gatherings. And as we know, like in-person is, you know, really special and it, it's generative in a different way. Um, so we couldn't really do that with the first iteration and it's definitely in line for the next one. Um, but yeah, the, the process kind of switching halfway between was that I don't want, I didn't want to give the impression or create a promise that, you know, me or Advaya or any, any of the people speaking had the answer. And so like a course, you know, is, is didactic. It teaches people things. And I, I know that that definitely went on. And certain people were selected to come and say things because they're experts in a certain area. But when it comes to the topic of how to relate, no one has the answer. Um, and so I was really wanting to get away from that, that kind of that central point of like this linear, we're going on this linear journey and you're going to learn how to relate by doing this, 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 and this. Instead, it was, um, we're all going into a bit of a morass together and we don't know what we're going to find. And we're doing it online, um, which, you know, is a little bit ironic given that we're talking about human connection and stuff like this, but with pandemic, this is the context we're in. So what are we going to do with it? Yeah, for sure. And how, how did that experience end up being? It was sometimes challenging for me because I am incredibly romantic about in-person connection. Like I, I am I am a hapless romantic about these things, mm -hmm. but it also generated conversations with people on the opposite side of the planet that were just I didn't know that it was possible to have that level of depth on zoom and we somehow managed to do it but perhaps that was because among the group the the level of like honesty and willingness and like desire to be together in whatever form we could be was so strong it kind of carried carried the whole thing and it felt really wonderful um yeah, and it, it kind of became like a weekly space that I was just so happy to go into, like a bit of a sanctuary. Amazing. I'm so, so glad to hear it. And you touched on some some pretty deep themes there and the kind of the rundown of the, the stuff you were exploring. Was there anything that really jumped out to you as kind of an, an insights or, or realisations or, you know, even senses that you were kind of like, oh, wow, like, you know, we've really touched something here through this? Um one of the things there are a few i'll try and remember them one of the things at the end of the course i perceived you know with a lot of projection going on in here as well but was the um the there was still a hunger for an answer like the, the sentiment from the cohort was that now what like what do we what do, what do we do with all of this and as much as i can resonate with that as someone who also likes clear answers it felt really interesting to me that we still a lot of us sort of spun back to that impulse of like needing to fill spaces needing to do something needing to act rather than simply be together and you know of course we need both of those things um so that was curious towards the end and um what were the other things that kind of jumped out one of the most I suppose controversial, it might be a bit of a strong word for what it was, but one of the most controversial topics we discussed was the topic of the individual. Um, and I have a lot to say about this and I've written, you know, about it as Schumacher, like from the perspective of ecology and one of my huge influences, Andreas Weber writes about it a lot from the perspective of biology is that the, in our kind of efforts in the social change world to push back against individualism, we're also erasing individuality and 
raising diversity and expressivity and agency in that and I'm really yeah adamant on this topic and so putting it into a course that at its core is trying to create a communal atmosphere and say we need to get out of our narcissism and saying but we need to also be individuals was like a bit of a there needed to be a lot of nuance in that but it was it was really incredible we had um Mina Salami, Charles Eisenstein and Andreas Weber talk on it and it was like great amazing yeah I mean both of those things I think it's it's such a hard tightrope to walk when you're, you're pushing back against so much sort of social conditioning isn't it because you know I mean on the one hand getting people to to let go you know particularly in the case of the, the what do we do now you know I think I would imagine a lot of the cohort of people that are interested in making the world a better place and showing up in ways that are, are better for other people and then to have kind of the answer and I have heavy inverted sort of air quotes for our, our audio listeners there to be kind of you know just being in something rather than go and do xyz is, is so so tough mm-hmm. and you know we are all other forms of education that we've been in are kind of the ones where you learn an answer you might go and action it and then kind of get the pattern back to doing so and that's incredibly tough and I guess it's it's kind of similar for the, the individualism point as well isn't it because we're kind of we're either deeply conditioned into individualism and then kind of conditioned into reaction against it as a result. And, you know, I'd love to, to talk a little around your, your work on Schumacher there um, later down the line, but just to, as a kind of brief summary, how, how did you and did you try and walk that, that tightrope? Oh my God. I mean, my life is like walking tightropes. <laughs> my whole life feels like walking tightropes. Um, in my yeah in my own kind of personal life or whatever there's been a transition in the last couple of years especially in the last year towards a way of being that um, is trying to make space for paradox and for things that would seem from like a hyper rationalist perspective dissonant Um, for example the fact that I am an individual and you know I'm completely enmeshed in not only the human community but the entire like biological world Um, and I can't ever extrapolate myself from that I can't exist in a vacuum and so how do I exercise my personal agency how do I stay porous enough to allow things and people and ideas and like growth in but how do I stay boundaried and so it's like for me life it's like a constant um, process of navigating these tight ropes or these 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 tensions um, between two things that don't necessarily have to be conflicting, but which Western culture, because of the heavy uh, foundation of dualism, makes conflicting. Um, and so, yeah, tight ropes galore for Hannah Close. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, big takeaway from our chat here is tight ropes. Um, I mean, absolutely. Um, and so do, do you think that was kind of one of the, the major things that you personally taken away from the kinship experience then was that kind of deepening of the commitment to, to paradox or tight rope? Yes. Um, really the whole thing, you know, so as, as I said earlier, the kind of the whole thing's about relationship, the kinship being a particular form of relationship. It's, you know, relationship, if you just say relationship, it can be quite um, neutral or like nebulous in some way. So hence kinship is a particular form, of, say intentional relationship. Um, but the point being that given the whole thing is about relationship, it's, it was really, and I was kind of learning as I was doing it and I could feel other people going through this process as well of like learning just how to re-relate, like really relate, not just be in each in proximity to each other, but really come into relation in like quite an intentional way. And it doesn't have to always be, you know, this heavy process of like, I'm navigating this boundary and I'm doing this in order to, you know, and I'm performing the relationship. But there was definitely a sense that, um, throughout the course that myself and others were really questioning um, yeah, the ways in which we've been relating and um, focusing on outcomes and not processes and yeah, just missing a trick. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, that heaviness you touched on there, I think is, is, is really interesting because kinship is, is a word that I think carries a lot of 
weight in our particularly you know traditional traditional usage and you know your your kin your blood all, in, in many ways and kind of all the the obligation and the, the duty and the you know the the tight knitness and the almost the pressure that comes with that is mm-hmm. quite kind of intensive so I wonder what your your understanding of, of kinship as, a, as, as an idea that has now kind of if not morphed into kind of is now as, as a result of this like how how would you want people to understand kinship yeah so it's um when when you say the word kinship it's like at least in my kind of more environmental philosophy circles it's usually associated with indigenous cosmology like it's so embedded into like very you know several indigenous cosmologies that it almost seems like the word is exclusive to that but it's it's not necessarily as you say you know you've got kith and kin which is like friends and family um my understanding of the word kinship is changing all the time and i use it in many different contexts because there are certain relationships i have with people that don't need a lot of work they just are really healthy because there's compatibility or there's shared value system or there's something in place that makes entering into that relationship incredibly like seamless and natural and i refer to these people as kin you know and at the same time that doesn't mean that people who it takes uh, a bit more work to come into relation with that they aren't that in fact they are kind of more that in some way because as you know when you overcome challenges in relationship with someone you go into a deeper relationship and that builds like a level of trust and familiarity and care um and like courage and all of these things um and it's really hard to say what kinship is but i would say i used to say it was an intentional form of relationship that gives life to the other and that i think i wrote somewhere it operates on the same principles as the breath which keeps us alive, which is emergence, reciprocity, and sentient awareness. Um, I wouldn't say intentional anymore because it can also be unintentional as I just sort of gave an example for, and it's hard to pin down, but it's not just relationship as in two people are in proximity to each other. It's there's, there's a deeper acknowledgement of the relationship as such. I think when kinship is at play and that, that idea idea i guess of like life givingness and becoming together or um, you know sympoesis like one might even say to, to drop a, a hint for some of the life itself residency series there mm-hmm. um yeah absolutely that, that's fascinating and you said that that kind of shows up a lot in sort of in environmental thinking and you know eco philosophy and indigenous cosmology is that the kind of understanding that it's held there or is there a um, sort of more specific usage Um, yes, yeah, it it is part of it. Um, Kin, you know, and I can't claim to be an expert on indigenous cosmologies, but from what I do know about it, kinship and kin is, there isn't even a word for it because it's just so embedded into the way of, way of living. Um, the entire, you know, community exists and functions and thrives off of these kinship relationships and they are they are given there's no you know i don't see indigenous communities kind of sitting in circles and talking about how to relate in you know the meta fashion the westerners do um not that you know that's like a terrible thing that we're doing i think it's great that we're inquiring into this but um in, in indigenous communities it's it's inherent and it's in it's it's kind of inherent in the way that um indigenous communities are part of nature and don't have a word for nature because it just is um whereas we're living in that kind of set bit of a separated state um sometimes um i mean i don't want to romanticize it too much because one of the core kind of inquiries in the kinship course was that i really didn't want to romanticize indigenous indigeneity um because I've seen what happens when Westerners are longing and lonely and they start appropriating, you know, indigenous cultures and, you know, colonizing basically, because we think we're devoid of these capacities and we're human beings, we're not devoid. 
Mm, absolutely. I think that's a beautiful way to put it. And it's kind of it's learning from rather than kind of seeing and trying to grab and grasp at and saying, I'm going to wretch this over here and create it for myself, isn't it? Which yeah. I think is, can be such a, a strong impulse, as you say, particularly when you're coming from a base of detachment and power, which is, can be a, quite a, a lethal combination. But it, yeah. Sounds like a really, really fascinating topic. And, you know, if you were to have one thing go out into the, the world from kind of the course or the understanding of kinship and, you, you know, you're just like, I wish everybody got this into their head. Kind of, would there be a thing? <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Um, kind of as we were talking about before, like, I don't, I'm mindful to overcomplicate it or like provide like a framework that people should, that I think people should jump into because I, I don't know I'm I'm completely relearning how to relate in every facet of my own life um but one thing one thing that I find myself sort of struggling against in a lot of social change discourse is the idea of <clears throat> throwing babies out with the bathwater. so <clears throat> things like okay, we've seen that individuality, individualism is bad, let's not throw it out all the way. We've seen that rationality can create harm, let's not throw it out all the way. Um, and I think in, you know, circles that congregate around something like kinships, there can be a lot of pain um, and suffering that has come at the hands of these things like individualism and, you know, capitalism and all of the things that are oppressing all of life. But yeah, my one kind of thought, I suppose, would be let's just let's just cultivate nuance um, and understand. You know, that might sound a bit abstract, but I hope it makes sense. Like, understand what's needed in what context, and um, let us not try and replicate the same like impulses that we're trying to eradicate of slicing up reality and saying no, not that, but yes, that because that very quickly just descends into the same fire. Yeah, that's absolutely. I think that makes perfect sense. And, you know, I think it's something that I, I also really yearn for and have, have been quite disillusioned with in many facets of my own experience of, of social change in, in various forms of that kind of, you know, and again, but with a real deep understanding of where that comes from. Because if you've had sort of, facets of society or of other people cause you deep pain and hurt and oppression then of course the emotional response is going to be to react against it and to kind of stand for the complete antithesis of it without that kind of as you say nuanced engagement so it's it's an inquiry that I, I too am really in is how to to foster that nuance in myself but also to promote it in a way that doesn't sound patronizing from a place of fundamental privilege of kind of saying like oh no you know you, you've got to understand that the lines are blurred and there is nuance when you know fundamentally i'm not the one that's getting trodden on quite so much as everybody else and it's a it's a thing to work towards so it's, i'm really really glad you raised it hannah um and just finally before we move on because i think that leads us in really nicely into sort of the topic around the experience of what we might call you know the social change ecosystem um that we've both shared where, where can people find out more about the kinship course and the next round and Advire more broadly? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so Advire is going into its next stage of evolution now and I'm so excited. Um, there's a lot kind of under wraps at the moment, but sort of towards the end of this year, we'll be you know launching a new um, membership platform, subscription model, podcast and lots of new courses coming and collaborations. Um, and yeah, the next iteration of the kinship course will be um, late winter next year, I think, early spring. Um, and the best way to sort of keep up with it is, is via the Advire socials or the, the website advire.co. Um, and I'll be sharing about it on social media as well. Um, but yeah, lots is cooking at the moment. So maybe the newsletter would be a good place to start. Sounds super exciting. So yeah, Advire on... Instagram, Facebook, all the rest of it, and then via just.co. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Well, everybody go check that out. Um, so I mean, yeah, one of the, the interesting a couple of the threads that I touched on there, both your kind of going, I think you said the, the cocoon mode a little bit and, and resetting. Um, and also this, you know, 
if not, well, I touched on my own occasional frustrations and so on. But we we've, we've talked about previously that you've kind of taken a bit of a, a step back from the social change ecosystem more broadly. Um, what's kind of sort of precipitated that, and you know, how how has that been? Um, well, I mean, I kind of. I when did I start doing stuff in this area it was probably around 2016-2017 so it's been five or six years which you know people have been doing activism stuff for much more well forever really um but in its current form um yeah that's when I got involved and I you know started out very optimistically running Experimental Thought Co and things evolved and you know then of course we had a pandemic and started moving into different areas of work um and then Schumacher and so yeah really bounced around and kind of ricocheted into different social change um organizations and like structures over the past few years which has been really a valuable learning experience um what changed for me was that I got a sense that the way things were being done were not futile but they weren't working as well as they could be and I was curious about why that was because to me there was a sense of um, alienation from the mainstream um, you know very intense privilege in the in the world of that at least you and I have been sort of operating between um, and a feeling that well are my skills best used here um, and it, yeah, it just became like a big, big sort of life question. And did I want to spend as much time working on basically intellectual work? Um, and when I got to Schumacher, things became a lot more grounded and embodied and it switched, something switched for me and said, actually, you might, you might, uh, affect more positive change in the world, attending to the 10 people around you than trying to influence entire subcultures and cultures. Not that that work isn't necessary, I think it completely is. Um, but for me, something was amiss. Um, and so, yeah, I've kind of, I'm still, I'm still in it, but my expectation of it is different. Um, I would like to consider myself less grandiose about change these days. I remember when I started Experimental Thought Co, I, really believed in influencing others with these ideas it's only later down the line did I realize that how kind of a little bit colonial that thinking might actually be and like oh we should all just follow this you know thought leader or we should all just follow this philosophy or this I might like, actually you know the human population is so crazily diverse um, and trying to funnel people into one theory of change or the next big idea is does feel a little bit futile to me. Um, sorry, that's a little bit rambling, but not at all. No, I mean, I think it's it's a really interesting point you touched on. It's again, I think it's it's one of those things that it can be kind of quite intoxicatingly attractive, can't it? I think particularly for those of us that perhaps are more intellectually inclined and notice that the world is on fire in all senses of the phrase to kind of go okay well you know let's have the the grand plan you know let's come up with the the master blueprint for how we sort everything out is a really kind of there's a real pull to that i mean you have to it's been all throughout history and look at high modernism as a as, a, as an intellectual lineage and deciding that you could design entire cities and civilizations sort of locked away in a room with a few other academics because you'd be best because you were smart and you know not to say that everybody in the social change scene is like that but I certainly know for myself that I've fallen into that a little at various points in my life and then had moments like yourself of kind of snapping to and being like oh this is starting to feel a bit icky yeah, um, yeah. particularly I think what's been interesting is you know it starts to feel a bit icky when you bump up against someone pushing back against you and saying well no I don't want to believe that yeah like, I believe something different and that's valid yeah. And again, it's there's yet another tightrope because we don't want to collapse into kind of postmodern subjectivity and you know all views are just as valid as, as others. Some things are pretty horrible, but 
at the same time not having that you know it's my grand plan we all need to follow mindset I mean yeah how, how are you sort of how do you now think about navigating that I guess particularly with that you know stepping back from the you know these are my big ideas and this is going to influence everybody and realizing that's a bit colonial but also I presume with that same awareness that you know there are some ideas that perhaps we should be trying to push more than others and yeah totally totally and I don't um like I, I kind of still value and respect the things that are going on I think one of the <clears throat> just to kind of build on what I was saying before one of the things that became apparent to me over several years of being in the space is a um and I know I'm part of the problem here and I, I hold my hand up you know as much as I can that there was not a lot of practicing what we preach um and so there wasn't a really genuine awareness of privilege in the space um and you know echo chambers are like you know people push back on echo chambers and I, I get it but also echo chambers you know you need critical mass to get something moving so I also understand that while that might be a blind spot in the space I still you know see its value but yeah I guess the cool thing I'm trying to say is that things started to feel a little bit disingenuous and as soon as you know any kind of social change initiative lifts off the ground gets absorbed into capitalism we inevitably you know have to make money and we have to scale and we have to turn things into commodities and brands and then people start competing with each other to say the next best thing and the ideas themselves become commodities which then turn into books and which then turn into like courses retreats and workshops and so there's you know I don't mean to sound um what's the word like pessimistic or something because I think all of these things have value as well but the way in which we um bring them about can be problematic for me and the particularly the notion of the personal brand and the thought leader I find very problematic and really um you know just totally embedded into capitalism and I, I wonder if those of us myself included in the network can see that and if we can and you know maybe there's not much we could do about it but perhaps we can have more conversations about it rather than pretending it's not there yeah absolutely I think you know the more critical interrogation with with blind spots and you know with with the, these issues the better and I, I it's something I've struggled with a lot I think stepping into and I think that's really interesting that you know the commodification of ideas and, and personas and, because it, it, it's it's so tough when people's identities and to be frank you know material livelihoods become attached to their social success in an mm -hmm. ecosystem that creates kind of fundamentally different incentive effects to having an impact on the world that you might want and you know those two things can often be in real tension and how to to kind of foster the ability for people to kind of collaborate and you know because I, I think you know ego is there for all of us you know that's certainly a part of it but also it is kind of there are material forces which lead one in a more egotistical direction than we like and you know pure altruism can leave you out on the street particularly in a kind of resource scarce social change sector and how to kind of marry that acknowledgement with you know we still want people doing work is something that I'm really grappling with at the moment yeah yeah it's a really thorny issue it's like um collaboration what is it what does it really mean what it like what does it really deeply mean because it gets a word that gets used a lot but I actually saw very little of it happening um in, in the genuine sense of the word and again you know I'm totally implicated in this uh, we, all, we all are and it's it's incredibly difficult and um you know I I, I just want to like put a little stake of the ground and say that I think the work people are doing is incredible and I don't think it should you know stop but I think having a we're very good at meta in this space but for some reason a meta awareness of our our own blind spots or well I mean that's why a blind spot is a blind spot but we haven't seemed to step back enough on our kind of own process um but yeah I'd be curious to have more conversations around that and I mean so I think we, we've touched on a little of perhaps one of the reasons why namely that kind of 
commodification, however much sort of by necessity of people sustaining themselves. But I wonder if there, you know, why do you think there hasn't been that kind of stepping back and reflecting oh, on our own processes? Yeah. And- um, this is really hard to look at your own shit. Like it's really hard to um, be called out because we still, you know, the whole of Western culture is still living in the kind of prolonged hangover of Christianity. We're still living in this hyper morality and the need to be good um, and the need to be seen being good, especially. Um, And to sort of, you know, we also now live in the era of being cancelled. And so raw mistakes aren't in the space like they could be um and yeah just because our our kind of paycheck depends on our public persona the you know the option for us to sabotage that for ourselves willingly is just there's no incentive at all uh you know and economically things are very difficult anyway and it makes me feel for people because i know a lot of people in the space who have this feeling of 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 um, disingenuousness and like, gosh, I wish I could had the conditions to live by the things that I preach and my the principles I talk about and the values that I share, like, yeah, with more with more integrity. But I can't because I live in a capitalist economy. Um, so yeah, but it's it's got something to do with vulnerability as well. I mean, I hark on about vulnerability all the time. It's obviously you know a bit of a hot point or, or, or a bit of a blind spot so there's something in my psyche that always gravitates towards it because I struggle doing it but I see what happens when people are vulnerable you know there is going back to a relationship there is no there is no intimacy without vulnerability um and good relationships have intimacy all kinds of relationship but you need to be vulnerable and it means it means being exposed in a culture that constantly tells us, you know, we have to appear a certain way, we have to act a certain way. It's um, basic kind of survival stuff, right? You don't want to, you don't want to be yeah. the black sheep or the, you know, it's, you get eaten or left behind. Get left behind, you get cancelled. Yeah, well, yeah, and I think that that I mean, the point around being cancelled, I think, is is a great one you phrased because I mean, that's again those kind of moving beyond binaries I think one of the things that I've noticed is quite rightly in you know at least our our corner of the social change ecosystem whichever however you'd like to call it that there's quite a a pushback against cancel culture and you know I think somewhat is somewhat legitimately I think many of us will probably acknowledge that a lot of the dialogue and discourse around cancel culture has become incredibly toxic and counterproductive to the very sort of legitimate and noble ends that it's sought to serve, namely the kind of overcoming of oppression and sort of tearing down of dominant and damaging power. But when you just have a, a, you know, woke is a slur in in this day and age. And it was something that I, when I was kind of started out my sort of social change career as a a bright eyed, bushy tailed young 18 year old super lefty, and then kind of got quite disillusioned with the way that the the left-wing circles I was in were operating and that Mm -hmm. part of why we weren't getting anywhere I thought was because of that very kind of confronting discourse approach to discourse but then moving here it's almost kind of like the the pushback has meant that we don't talk about any of those kind of like you know topics Mm -hmm. because you know you're we're cancel proof because cancelling is bad And, and thus there's been a a real sidestepping, I think, to, to put it bluntly, of issues around race and of around gender and those kind of broader blind spots which are really showing up in society that I think should inform our approach to social change because that that discourse has become so toxic in other areas of it. I don't know if yeah. that resonates with your experience. Yeah, totally. And it's it's really, um, you know, this, this, this idea that we can be like pure and perfect and not, not make mistakes and not offend people is kind of anti-human, um, I don't know what the, the quote is, to like to air as the human or something. And of course, there's oh, yeah. a side to this story of, um, you also have to be, you know, really mindful and really, if you can avoid like 
I don't, even the word offend now is so loaded. If you can avoid offend, like it implies something about the level of agency they have in the relationship and what they're receiving and what you're projecting and all sorts of stuff. Um, it just, it scares me a little bit um, that we can't make mistakes. But then on, yeah, on the flip side, you kind of get people who consistently make the same, you know, there, there is, you know, racism, for example, is still so prolific, even, even in the activist world, you know, whether, not that people, you know, are explicitly racist, but I read um, Me and White Supremacy recently, and I, I don't, obviously don't consider myself a racist, but after reading this book, I was like, well, it's so systemic, it's so embedded within the culture that like we can't really get away from it so we need to own up and say yeah we're doing this yeah but, absolutely but yeah the cancel thing is profoundly anti-ecological um you know part of part of the human spirit is is making mistakes and even the word mistake is like we learn by doing and my fear is that no one's going to learn anything if they don't say anything or if they don't yeah. do anything. um and people are just becoming more and more without agency as this, this continues to spiral. And, and scared to acknowledge our infallibility. So I mean, I think that that racism point is, is a great one and it applies to, to all kinds of structured oppression is that we need to make the, the distinction between saying, you know, slapping a label on and saying, you are a racist, sexist, homophobe, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then saying fundamentally, we have been, all of us grown up in conditions of structured oppression where these things are baked into the very fabric of our society. And to say that we won't have internalized some of that is absurd. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't mean that uh, you have to kind of self-flagellate and go, you know, I am a, a racist of the highest order. I am a sexist. I'm, but, you know, do I have impulses that have been shaped by patriarchy? Absolutely. Do I have impulses that have been shaped by structural racism? Absolutely. Yeah. And admitting that and owning them and sort of dealing with them together is the only way we move past it. Not by kind of saying, you know, like, how dare you imply that I'm racist because we talk about structured oppression. Yeah, totally. And, I mean, and that's one of the interesting points that's kind of, it's brought up for me, the, the conversation that, that you and I had last year about your experience of, of womanhood going through kind of your, your life in, my life in social change with Hannah Close. There you go. There's a, an autobiography for you in the next few years. But, I mean, and yeah, we'd just really love to, to explore that a little bit with you. Because I mean, it was interesting to hear that, you know, when you set out as someone that kind of almost actively rejected the term feminist and feminism and, you know, kind of didn't want to be associated with, with that as a, a brand and ideology, whatever. And then I've kind of been on a bit of a, a journey since then of your experience of being a woman in this space. Um, so yeah, we'd just love to, to hear a little more about that. Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, it, you know, it's it's a thorny topic. It's a thorny topic. Um, yeah. and it's one that I always avoided talking about because as a sort of white, cis, Western privileged woman, my level of privilege is like astronomical compared to most of the world population. Um, and so for me to somehow go into like an oppressed role as a woman, you know, in the patriarchy, feels disingenuous um it feels a lot of the times unnecessary and yet it is the case um it is the case and i mean this is what intersectionality is all about but people you know even white men you know can experience oppression and just kind of like it, everyone can um you know everyone can be othered in some way and when i started in the space it was very very um male dominated but also just very masculine um in the way that things were sort of being conducted um and I many years ago took that on and thought it was the right way to do things so I mimicked and also you know being someone who loves philosophy and um has been in academia and like really valued that and deeply embedded in the meritocracy and thought that my worth was totally like strapped onto rational intelligence, academic intelligence. I just went full steam head into like, yes, you know, follow this male thought leader, this male thought leader and be like them because their form of intelligence I have learned is the most superior and should be aspired to. And then 
that all collapsed. Um, and two, three years ago, I just sort of was like, this isn't working. This isn't working. This isn't how I feel things um, should be done on the inside. Something felt really dissonant and really wrong. Um, that's when I started like turning my attention more towards ecology and I've always been like a nature lover and I've always spent a lot of time outdoors and stuff. But I started turning my attention towards different forms of intelligence and places where I could find those forms of intelligence. Um, and they weren't just all female spaces either. They were just different ways of doing things. Um, Cause I don't believe that it's like, oh, men are the problem and men just need to go away. I don't think that at all. I think patriarchy is a problem. Um, and men suffer from it too, as well. But yeah, in terms of like in the in the kind of activist social change space, it is at least in the ones that I've been in, you know, tangibly linear, um, very averse to things like vulnerability. Um, mystical themes are often discussed from like a very sort of like empirical viewpoint. Um, there's a huge aversion to like woo, which I understand, but again, with that, the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater. Um, and yeah, my, my kind of, well, my experience of it now is I work on a team of all women. Um, so <laughs> it's, quite, like, it's quite different. Like I've worked in mixed teams. I've worked with just men. I've worked just by myself. Um, and I'm really enjoying working with a team of young women. And we do feel like a bit of an island in the in the social change ecosystem um but the way of working and the way of doing things is just so profoundly different and gentle but not pushover you know these are all stereotypes um but yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what do you think has been the the most profound difference you've noticed moving into an all-female team particularly The hierarchy isn't as explicit um you know i have a boss you know and i also delegate to others there is it's not like we don't deny hierarchy um but it isn't as explicit and we don't have to park the personal at the front door at the office door that gets you know woven into um there isn't a sense that we have to like hide parts of ourselves or our lives um there isn't a sense, there's no competitiveness, there's no need to perform. Um, there is especially no need to say the most clever or profound thing, which I have experienced in other spaces of just like the rhetoric is so like center to everything. Um, and just the way we relate, you know, I, there's a, a real risk here of me sort of like fetishizing you know all women's spaces and like oh we're just like so connected and we know how to do it it's not true um but overall the kind of receptivity and sensitivity of the space is different and it's generative and for me personally when I'm in those spaces which I have been in with men as well it's not just like you know female body thing um i work better, I make better things. Um, yeah. And I think people have seen that and engaged with different things that I've worked on at different phases of my life and gone, whatever you were doing there seemed really generative. And I was like, yeah, because I was felt safe and happy. Mm, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's so interesting because pretty much everything you reeled off there is kind of like the the playbook for like teal organizations, right? You kind of, you read Reinventing Organizations by Lulu and that, you know, bring your whole self to work, sort of get rid of the hierarchy somewhat and, you know, and leave that kind of dominating rhetoric at the door and all the rest of it. And it's, it's fascinating that there's such that, that close alignment with, with kind of the, the more natural kind of organic experience that you are having in that context. And yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's the important distinction between the masculine and feminine as I suppose like energy or archetypes or, you know, however when you say them and you'll probably know the, the Jungian, sort of descriptions of those better than I and it's kind of like men and women isn't it mm -hmm. but it does certainly seem the case that it is a lot more of the kind of the feminine energy context which we've identified the most healthy and generative ones to operate in yeah 
yeah and it's like you know I don't want to get too kind of binary about it but there's we need each other you know like I really um as I kind of said before like men are suffering just as much from patriarchy as as, as women are um and I, I really think that both sides and beyond can bring so much to the table together like the last thing I would want is for like male and female camps of different you know NGOs kind of pitched against each other because I just don't think it works that way but given things are so out of balance at the moment it is yeah really refreshing to be in an all female environment just for now um yeah um how do you see kind of that that route to a more intuitive approach in the, in the more medium and long term because you know I think I would hope the vast majority of us, regardless of our position on, you know, other other issues around gender, energies, et cetera, et cetera, would kind of see that there is a bit of a disbalance. I mean, just numerically, if nothing else. Um, mm -hmm. But more focusing at the level of energy than kind of like get more women in and fill the quota. What what do you think kind of needs to be done? Um, well, the way our platforms run and the way we share our ideas and information and findings and theories the whole like infrastructure is based on literally platforming an individual who's going to say stuff to you know an anonymous audience i think the very infrastructure of our platforms need to be decentralized and more conversational and more about dialogue than just individual characters saying really clever things. Um, you know, I haven't got a thing against clever things. I think intelligence is good, <laughs> but the, yeah, I think we need to, to move away from this. Again, in my view, it's a very like Christian kind of savior messiah complex that, that kind of proliferates um, the underbelly of this scene of like these individuals are going to save us I think a more feminine approach would be much more decentralized and community-based and it's not like I don't believe that we need leadership either but I you know I think we do um but that would be one way um and yeah moving away from the, the kind of lecture format into more like collective inquiry um yeah Hmm. I mean, I, I think if, even if we stop there, those are, those are some great observations and insights. I think I, I really agree with you. And, you know, I think the the point to emphasize there in my mind is, you know, you kind of have to qualify and say we do need leadership, but leadership doesn't have to be this kind of dominating hierarchical force, right? Yeah. yeah. One of the really, you know, so my background is unsurprisingly less from all female organizations, but more from that kind of, you know, holocracy, decentralized governance, et cetera, and the kind of the thing that we we drum into people when teaching about this stuff is it's not an organization with no leaders it's an organization with lots of leaders mm. where actually everybody steps into a leadership role in some some capacity or another and i think that that cultivation and again i think it, it's so interesting there that the overlap between that and the prior point we touched on and kind of the crabs in a barrel everybody jostling for their own individual kind of sort of well-being and making it and the contrast between that and uh, sort of situation where we're all leaders together in a collective enterprise yeah seems night and day so you know the listeners please do draw out a connection there if you're, i can't do it on the spot but there seems to at least um be a linkage in my mind um yeah i mean really thank you for, for sharing your experience so honestly that i mean i think it's it's really great to to get those insights and i think in total agreement with you that we need to all talk about this stuff a whole lot Mm. even though it's uncomfortable <laughs> and often quite awkward um, and you know learn by fumbling our way through it to do it increasingly skillfully um, yeah. yeah now just the, the final point I'd, I'd love to touch on on your kind of you know your drift into different winds perhaps we should say is one of the, the really interesting points that, that you've raised to me in a, a personal catch-up is your kind of your reconnection with profanity which seems to be a, a, a funny thing to, to weave into, you know, the feminine energies and, um, you know, all, all the rest of it. But, yeah, what, how, what, what does that mean to you? What, what's that mean? And how has that, that shown up? Um, 
I love this question. And it does relate because so <clears throat> when I when I started out with this social change thing, it was all about being good and being pure and appearing to be a certain way and acting a certain way and um, not doing anything anti-ecological, you know, trying my hardest not to participate in capitalism and any any kind of you know enthusiastic participation meant that I was bad activist or I was a fraud. Um, so on to profanity. Well, <clears throat> I've kind of moved away in the last year or so, especially the last six months, from this um, feeling like I need to perform as a morally good person. And having grown a little bit older and experienced a few more things, you know, I'm still, I suppose, pretty young, but the pandemic just like propelled me into something and now I feel very old for some reason. Um, I kind of got in touch with some raw messiness about being human and I stopped trying to pretend it wasn't there and I stopped trying to um, you know shave off the sharp edges and I felt like I was wading through a morass and it was part of that um, the kind of spiritual purity that I had been aspiring to, the deep inner work, um, the going up the teal, uh, not the teal, the integrals, you know, all of that stuff, going up, purification, I just let go of it because it was turning me into a bit of an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, who's to say I'm not still like that? But it's, um, my sense is that we talk a lot about the sacred, um, in the social change world and you know there's, there is an influence from spirituality there's a very heavy influence from buddhism especially um we talk a lot about the sacred and we don't often talk about just how close the profane is to the sacred and how the two interact and you know there's a reason why you know i don't know much about tarot but the the fool is like the wisest character um and i really I really resonate with that and just like from a personal level the more I let myself dance you know I stopped drinking for a while and I haven't like, gone back to boozing loads but like I don't prohibit myself from enjoying a glass of wine like I used to um the more I I let myself get dirty with the things in the world that you you, you shouldn't do the closer I feel to my own humanity like the closer I feel to a sense of, um, you know, we were talking about making mistakes earlier. I don't beat myself up for these things like I used to. Um, and so I suppose as my self-acceptance has increased with, with the reintroduction of profanity, whatever that is into my life, the better I'm able to be towards others because there's less repression or like beating myself up and wanting other people to be pure with me and like why are you doing that you know and trying to police other people because the whole time I was just trying to police myself and it was yeah. good. I think that's such an astute observation because it is so interesting isn't it how that kind of real striving to kind of fit ourselves into this incredibly rigid ideal that we paint can actually drag ourselves away from the very things that we're kind of trying to attain there I mean it's funny, I was just before we jumped on this call, I was listening or reading an article about kind of like a, a recovering conscious hip hop fan. And, you know, I used to be really into conscious rap music back in the day. And they were real, kind of this article really spoke to my experience of, you know, the whole thing was me listening to people that were really turned on about the issues of the world. And like anybody that listened to like normal rap music was like lesser than me and kind of like, you know, and. I mean, Christ, I look back at my old, thankfully now deleted Twitter and kind of talking about how, you know, Kanye is not real hip hop, man. He doesn't talk about the issues anymore. Like, well, all this kind of stuff. And you're like, hey, I'm just being a dick and I'm not having any fun. Mm. But B, you get so caught up almost in that posturing that you're kind of don't then have the, the energy or the aptitude to go out into the world and do the very things that you're claiming to care so much about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I spoke about it <clears throat> a while ago with Doug Rushkoff about, I used the metaphor of being covered in shit because it, it is so much easier 
when you are honest about the shit that you're covered in, you know, this is hopefully a metaphor, um, you are inherently in a position of vulnerability because your very position goes against the like perfection, the honed image that Western culture says that we must appear as. So when you come across other people who have this level of, you know, self-awareness and, and, and vulnerability, the capacity for deeper relation is so much more and that, you know, in my own life, I kind of really gravitate towards people who have those rough edges because it's just so much easier to come into relation with them um, and so much more fruitful. And they're not bad people, um, they're human and they're trying. Um, yeah, maybe that's a bit romantic, but yeah, just in terms of relationship, it's, it just yields so much more. Yeah, absolutely. Owning your shit. I think it's a great way and you know I, ironically we probably do all come into this world and leave it covered in shit in one sense or another and having kind of that attuneness with that being quite a core part of what it means to be human mm. I think is is vitally important and very easily lost particularly when we first kind of open our eyes to be at the wonders of either spirituality on the one hand or conscious hip-hop music on the other <laughs> it's easy to get pulled a bit far into that as a, a rabbit hole um well yeah i'm i'm certainly glad that you've you've rediscovered the joys of the profane and look forward to to reveling in it with you in, in quite soon i'm sure um i mean it sounds like you know i think we're moving on to the final portion of our, of our interview here but it sounds like you know your time at schumacher particularly has been incredibly transformative mm-hmm. so i think I'd, I'd be remiss without briefly touching on how that experience has been for you and you know what, what you're taking from it as, as the core thing. So for those that, that don't know, do you want to first speak a little around, you know, the approach of Schumacher College as an institution, the course that you're doing and kind of what set that apart? Yeah, so um, Schumacher started 30 years ago. It was founded by the Jain monk Satish Kumar. Um, and it basically runs uh, MAs and sort of short courses. And now this year they're starting BAs in like, holistic education and transformative education um so there's still you know there's still rigorous degrees insofar as i'm getting a master's degree that's been accredited by you know a larger university um but they run various different courses so the one that i'm doing is called engaged ecology but they also run um regenerative economics ecological design thinking movement mind and ecology poetics of imagination you know really good broad um set of set of kind of disciplines and it's all very interdisciplinary um it's all very hands-on which i think is what distinguishes the um schumacher approach from any other kind of educational institution at least ones that deliver actual degrees um so my course is 50 percent theory and 50 percent practical so we would look at like eco philosophy um you know, critical thinking, these kind of, we would learn how to write academically and like create an argument. Um, and then we would also be doing things like carving spoons, weaving baskets, making fires, planting seeds, um, and grounding the things we had learned, you know, in the books into our, our lived experience, which is absolutely what's missing from the dominant uh, education system there's no ground everything is just pure abstraction and there's nothing wrong with abstraction as long as it can be tethered to something um so that's the kind of yeah that's the schumacher approach and my ma engaged ecology is is kind of i guess its core discipline is environmental philosophy and environmental humanities um but it's really asking three core questions. And if I remember them correctly, they are, um, what is place? Who are we? What then can we do? And so it takes a really broad view of the situation humans are in at the moment, what led us here, um, including like what ideas, what ideologies, what sort of behaviors. Um, and we like have a historical overview of basically how did we get to the point of collapse? Um, and then we, yeah, we, we look at what activism is doing well at the moment and we, we propose new ideas for how activism could be done. Um, we look at our role, like as individuals within all of this, like how much agency do we have? 
Um, we look at how to form um, like resistance movements, communities of change, uh, all, all sorts of stuff that basically contribute to the overall predicament we're in. We're just like asking questions about it and like, what, what do we do? What do we, what do we do? We've been trying to do something for a long time and it's not worked. So why hasn't it worked? Mm, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, and without putting you on the spot and getting you to answer the three big questions, um, <laughs> what has kind of been the, the more sort of profound threads or kind of, you know, areas of inquiry or kind of insights that you've touched on over the course of this? I mean, it sounds like there's been so much sort of deeply fascinating content and things to explore, but. Yeah. Um, so I discovered the term animism while at Schumacher, which I think when most people hear it immediately, they jump to this idea of like a primitive religion of people worshiping rocks, um, which is, you know, the unfortunate um, stereotype. But after looking more into that, I, you know, discovered that animism is a, a kind of relational ontology, um, you know, kinship and things like this really weave into it. Um, it's a kind of, we only started really looking at it in the, in the, in well, my second year, but it completely just blew something open for me, uh, in that there was a, there was a frame for something that I had long had an intuition about, but couldn't give voice to, because it, there just wasn't, um, the language for it in, in Western culture. And the more and more we looked into animism as a kind of, yeah, relational ontology that looks at how reality comes forth through a process of relation um, and how you know that can manifest in healthy and unhealthy ways yeah the more things just made sense to me there was another kind of breakthrough moment for me when we were doing a module called making connections and we were learning lots of ancient crafts um, which might seem somehow like indulgent or obsolete but it just totally blew me open in terms of what embodied intelligence really means and what it does to the attention to make something with your hands because everything is just you know we take everything for granted it's just like everything's made made for us by a machine now it just switched something in my brain like completely switched something and since doing that I've I've sort of gone well here's my intellectual life you know and I'm not sliced it down the middle but I've I've really started to invite practical making doing back into my life rather than just like purely thinking about stuff all the time and that's that's made me much happier I think well you know it's very simple really but if it can do that for me why can't I do it for other people yeah that's fascinating I mean it's something that I think many of us have become incredibly alienated from. But just just looping back to, to the animism point to start with then so you kind of said you described animism as a, a relational ontology and then said that it's, it's been a, a frame that's kind of given you the ability to express and kind of make sense of things that were, were implicit but but didn't necessarily have the, the means of doing so. Do you want to expand a little bit more on a what you mean by animism as, animism as a re relational ontology and also kind of how this this frame you know what it's cast out as is this frame and how it's helped you with your, your meaning making and yeah, so I guess, um, I mean, I'm still learning about it and I've been a little bit out of touch with, with the theoretical side of it for a couple of months now, so I'm a little bit rusty, but my, my kind of um, sense of it was that it's not like panpsychism, which says, you know, everything is, has the same consciousness as you, but what animism does is it respects the agency and aliveness of other things and there's like a spectrum of what another thing could be. So it could be abiotic or biotic, meaning it could be like an organism, it could be organic matter, or it could even be a piece of technology. And there's been a lot written on how, especially Western humans are animistic in the way that they relate to technology. Like they, they can anthropomorphize it and things like this. But again, that's not quite what animism is. And I think it gets lumped in with anthropomorphism quite a lot. The way I see it is more as a kind of framework that shows us 
that the world is inherently relational and that things do not precede relations, but relations, if anything, precede things. Um, and in a culture that focuses really on outcomes and objects, like individual units of being, animism kind of says actually the space in between, i.e. the relationship, is just as important and, and is the thing that creates aliveness. Um, so yeah, it, it can be like a little bit complex and I don't feel like I have a good a good a grasp on the theory as I, as I did a few months ago, but I can say in my own living of my actual human life, nothing feels more true. Um, it really points to the embeddedness um, of everything and the like enmeshment um, and the like, complex entanglement of, of everything. Um, it's kind of the opposite of, you know, Newtonian atomism, which says that we're all just like particles floating around, bumping into each other. It's, um, there's an anthropologist, Tim Ingold, who's really great. He was on the kinship course, who talks about animism as um, pointing to a process of becoming along the lines of our relationship, which I thought was good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lovely way of describing something. Um... And yeah, and how, how has that, do you think, then shifted your kind of the way that you, you make sense and interpret the world or, or actually just live into the world? Um, I feel I feel more porous. I feel like less of less alone. Um, you know, I don't I go I spend a lot of time in nature and I do a lot of hiking. I don't you know, I don't have that experience of looking at it and sort of seeing symbols and signs in it and I don't think that's wrong either it's not my experience um but I don't feel like I've been plonked into it which you know I've had that experience before of feeling like I'm just a, a, a thing that's like walking across the top of the earth because I'm so conditioned by abstraction um but I do have a sense that when I'm out in the world I have a sense of I used to experiment with psychedelics a lot many years ago. I don't anymore because life just feels like that anyway. Like I feel like I have not to the same level of like potency, but I often am walking around, especially when I'm in a natural setting and I'm just like so in it and in a way that feels very, you know, akin to some psychedelic experiences I've had. Um, I can't really explain it, but it's good. Um, and it makes me very sad that, you know, the world is, the world, at least the natural world is um, just being constantly diminished because it feels like an extension of myself uh, that's being diminished. Wow, that does sound incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, that's a pretty big shift, I think, from from the way that most of us kind of however much we wouldn't like to relate to, to the world around us, in particular to touch on the natural world. Um, yeah, I mean, fascinating to, to hear those insights, Hannah. Thank you so, so much for, for taking the time to chat. I mean, yeah, I think the, the final thing, again, you know, I'll, I'll return to, to this theme of questioning, but if you kind of could relay out to people one thing that you've, you've drawn from Schumacher kind of been, an, an insight or a kind of, you know, a, a piece of advice even, or wh whatever it may be, um, what would that kind of one transmission be? No pressure. <laughs> pressure. Um, it's got nothing to do, whatever it is that I want to say, it's got nothing to do with any theories I've learned there, um, even animism. Um, in a way, my time at Schumacher, it was the, 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 the kind of profound shift for me came more from me being with the other humans there than it did have anything to do with what we were actually talking about. It was the quality of the relationships we were forming. And maybe because we were all there under the same sort of, like things are really bad there was so much like everything was amplified and so I guess what I would say out of that is um, 
got something to do with not forgetting the people around you. Um, because I think in our efforts to create change, you know, rightly so in some contexts, there's a, there's a need to project and scale and influence, but we forget about the people close to us. We forget that actually when we, when we try and repair the relationships in the world, the most effective and the most gratifying way to do that is to start with the ones next to you and then keep going rather than going, you know, you annoy me, I'm not going to talk to you, but I'm going to try and repair this culture. But actually, if we're going to, you know, act as ecology acts, as the ecosystem acts, we, we start from there outwards. It's a bit of a roundabout way of saying, you know, be nice to people. But <laughs> as, as, we, as we said before this call, just be sound, or in your own, just don't be an arsehole. But... Arsehole. I'm trying my best I'm trying my best and sometimes I am and when I am I'm just like all right learn from it nice isn't it yeah I mean absolutely I think that's a, a beautiful beautiful note to, to leave things on a really nice bookend going from from kinship and the power of, of relationships all the way through to to keeping them in mind as we step step out into the world so yeah, once again, Hannah, thank you so much. You know, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. We've, I think we've touched on a lot um, and just really, really appreciative of, of your time and your incredible levels of, of insight and general wonderfulness as, as a human. So deep thanks to you. Thank you, Theo.